Open your cerebral cortex and shift your lobes into upper beta phase because you are going to have Bitcoin knowledge transmitted directly into your vestibulocochlear. Your host at Bitcoin Knowledge is Trace Mayer, an early Bitcoin advocate since it cost a quarter, but this is not intended to be investment advice. A doctor of jurisprudence, but this is definitely not legal advice. And an investor in core cryptocurrency infrastructure, including Armory, BitPay, Kraken, and Mitagio, but this is not a recommendation of those services. Here, you get fed via direct mind download with pure and free Bitcoin knowledge. Welcome back. We've got Justin Blinko. He's the Chief Operating Officer for Coinable. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Trace. Great to be here. So can you tell us a little bit about Coinable? It's uh, actually a pretty cool service. You got all types of fun things over there. So just give us a brief overview of what it does. Yeah, so Coinable was founded in 2012 by Ira Miller and Eric Voorhees and started out with uh, the ability to send Bitcoins over SMS and email. So a lot of people back then getting their first Bitcoins uh, actually used Coinapult's underlying plumbing to uh, get those. Uh, since then, we've been refining our service, hopefully uh, in, in an improving direction, um, and added some other applications on top of that. Um, one of them being Locks, which is a, a service that allows both businesses and consumers to protect themselves against the Bitcoin price volatility. And... Um, the other focus we've been doing is uh, internationalizing. So um, the company was founded in the U.S., but we've uh, taken some steps to make ourselves more of a global presence. Yeah, you guys all moved down to Panama City, right? That's correct. Uh, where it's nice and warm. Always uh, hot. Away from the cold, frigid New York. <laughs> and uh, I love the name, Coinapult. It's kind of like a catapult, but for throwing Bitcoins at people. Yep. You can throw them via email or via SMS, like you said. Are you starting to see some traction gaining in places like Africa or these developing countries? Africa, not hugely. Um, we've been talking to some people in Africa that are really excited about the service and kind of understand how it could uh, change things in their country, but we're not seeing huge volume yet. I think it's mostly a visibility problem of, you know, if you live in Kenya, have you heard of Quinnipol? No. Um, so one of our next struggles in probably in 2015 is how do we um, advertise our services and communicate the you know what we can do but we are seeing pretty good accelerating growth in Latin America so like Argentina, Argentina or New Mexico Mexico or? Argentina um, some in Mexico uh, Venezuela uh, and also Brazil uh, okay. which is where we are nice yeah we're in nice sunny Brazil on Copacabana Beach like just sipping our drinks trying to do a podcast <laughs> It's just so nice here. It is really wonder, nice. No wonder they don't get much done in South yeah. America. We're, we're in our suits and looking at everybody on the beach enjoying themselves, and, and here we are talking about crypto, which luckily is what we love to do. Yeah, no kidding. So you've got the, this new service, these locks. Yeah. Uh, it's really quite an innovative approach. There's Bit Reserve and then Quintiple. Yeah. We, we, I've actually interviewed Halsey Miner for the, nice. the podcast. What exactly is happening with these locks? With locks, it's similar to what you could do on an exchange. So if you're a professional Bitcoin trader, you could go to Kraken, open an account, um, go through the KYC process, um, send your Bitcoin and do some trading. You know, hedge, get dollars, um, you know, eventually cash out if you wanted to or buy back into Bitcoin, hopefully at a lower price and make a profit. So locks differs from that model in that we try to make it a little bit more simple for people that aren't of a financial background. So uh, you won't see any limit orders um, basically, there's a price to lock and a price to unlock, um, and you choose which the amount. Which is based on the current spot prices. Yeah, so we plus we have the an, premiums or whatever. Yep. So we have an index price that pulls from all the major exchanges. Um, we have accounts there, and we basically do arbitrage between all the exchanges. So we pull what we think is the globally appropriate price, and uh, we're you know we're putting our money behind that by 24/7 offering trades based on that, and then a 0.75 spread in each direction, so 1.5 between the bid and ask. Now, in your terms of service, it's the liabilities are actually in bitcoins, right? Yeah. So we, we so, uh, so it's sorry. different from Bit Reserve, if I understand it correctly. From what I understand, Bit Reserve will actually have the assets; they'll have the gold, or they'll have the yen, or the euros, or the dollars, or whatever. But you guys have the Bitcoin, and then it just 
changes the amount of Bitcoins in the account based on the current price of the underlying? Based on our terms of service, we uh, I think we innovated the term, we called it a variable Bitcoin balance. So it's where in like a blockchain wallet, you'd have a stable Bitcoin balance. If I have one Bitcoin, you have Bitcoin. Uh, we call ours a variable Bitcoin balance. So if you locked dollars and the price of Bitcoins goes down, your variable Bitcoin balance goes up um, uh-huh. or vice versa. But similar to BitReserve, um, we are actually buying the underlying assets to hedge ourselves um, against the, uh, the, the, the exchange, exchange rate, rate volatility. Exactly. So... Um, Within a minute, usually, of any lock or unlock, um, or we also do serve business partners as a liquidity partner, um, within a minute of any of those transactions, we've hedged ourselves. So when we're looking at the amount of customer funds, it's all 100% reserves? Yes, right? 100% reserves. Is there like a, a transparency report or an audit report or anything along those natures yet that kind of establish the authenticity of that assertion? We haven't introduced anything uh, publicly yet. Um, um, we've been looking at many options and haven't yet been satisfied with the ability to not compromise the privacy and security of our customers with the obvious benefit of publicly giving provable transaction chains and, and uh, asset amounts. Yeah, because you know those gold bugs, like <laughs> me chief among them, right? I know over at Gold Money, we've got this gold money guarantee and every single bar on the pallet in the vault is like counted physically every three months by our auditor inspectorate so there's just this very solid like chain of integrity chain of custody and proof like audits on a regular basis so i was just wondering like if coin of bolts doing that are going to be going in that direction as more funds get under management because it is very expensive for us to do those audits yeah um but you know, hopefully the customers over there appreciate it and are willing to pay for it. Yeah, that's the part of the balance that we're trying to uh, find is, you know, we've been talking to companies that do uh, insurance, so actually get this, the funds fully insured, um, whether they're in a Bitcoin balance or a locks balance. And with locks, you know, it's certainly, uh, you, you can make it so that we never hold any Bitcoin at all. Um, it can come from another wallet, um, we lock it and then send it out to another wallet, but we never hold the Bitcoin. So it's just holding, you know, traditional assets, uh, which insurance companies are more comfortable and familiar with. Yeah. Um, and we've, we've also been talking with auditing firms and explaining our business model and trying to find the right partner that understands our cost model. And we're working on figuring out how much our customers are willing to pay. We right now don't charge anything to hold locks. You know, you can hold it for as long as you want. Um, and th- there's no fee to that. So if you start adding insurance and other costs, um, you know, we might have to... Um, add in you know different tiers of service or, or something like yeah that. so where is coinable thinking of going like now that you've got these locks out are you looking at like just expanding the amount of locks or are there going to be additional products coming out like so we think that our sms launch could potentially bring on a lot of mainstream users that wouldn't use bitcoin otherwise so let's say you're living in canada and you have family in africa and you want to send the money back um, Bitcoin's relatively easy to acquire in Canada. There's you know, exchanges and Bitcoin ATMs. You can send that money via lock over SMS, and your family member would get that $10 worth of locks, and that would be $10 worth um, until they wanted to exchange it or you know, buy something online. Um, and so they wouldn't have to worry about you know, what is the Bitcoin price uh, today. You know, they're not having to log into Bit- Bitfinex and figure out what's going on. Um, so this could really drastically reduce these remittance costs uh, because people can still remit in their regular numeraire like Canadian dollars or US dollars but at the same time uh, the receiver is able to control this all with SMS so they get down to the local bodega or where, where whatever you know where the person hands them the ten dollars of cash and when they send them over the text message that controls the ten dollars with the bitcoins am i seeing this correctly yeah um and we're you know trying to you know see what people are using our services for and talk to our users and we don't know all the cool things that it could potentially do so we're trying to get a better sense of um you know how are you using this and and then improve our service based on that um so one thing that a number of people um, have brought up is the actual, you know, what about could I fit physically hold the gold or get the gold out? Um, so we've been talking with bullion companies and, and um, you know, working to make a deal where I've got a gold ounce, I want it shipped to me, um, a gold ounce, a locked gold ounce, and um, want to cash it out in gold. Um, 
So I think there's a lot of potential partnerships with traditional financial companies or payments companies um, where you know we can kind of be part of the bridge between the crypto and the traditional you know uh, financial world. Have you guys thought of using things like Ripple then to hold some of these balances? Or um, I mean, is that kind of on the radar? Or right now it seems like you just log in and it's like you're balancing the Quinnipult, uh system, but you're but you can't actually like take the locked gold out of Quinnipult. Yeah, it's but but if it were Ripple, then perhaps people could. Currently, it's only Bitcoin in and Bitcoin out. That's the the only option within our system, unless you're a KYC business with us. Um, so yeah, I, I, we haven't looked at using Ripple gateways or becoming a Ripple gateway or, or that system closely. Um, but we are starting to look into that direction now that we have everything up and stable to uh, try to bring on those type of value added services that would make the user experience better. Why the remittance business? Like, what do you, what do you see there? Well, if you've ever actually done a remittance or um, even just gone through the motions of seeing, okay, I'm in Canada and I want to send money to um, Brazil, um, you, you see that the fees that they charge, um, especially for uh, you know the non-mainstream currencies outside of the U.S. dollar and euro and yen, the fees start at 10% and go up from there, especially on smaller amounts. People talk about Bitcoin's killer app, um, and remittance certainly could be that, but obviously Bitcoin is just a protocol, and the people that are sending remittances can't think about you know, what's going on in the background. So we think that Locks could provide that you know, front-end, friendly interface that people could use in a familiar way to transmit value throughout the world without um, worrying that you know, it's the, the blockchain and, and this trustless money system that's actually doing the heavy lifting. Because, I mean, you're transferring at the speed of a text message. I was in Singapore last year, and down at the mall, there were three floors, and you had all the house cleaning ladies, like, in line, yeah. thousands of them. It was unbelievable, all standing in line to fill out their remittance form to send money back to Bangladesh or the Philippines or wherever. Yeah. I mean, if you're able to do this with the speed that you're talking about, then, I mean, that drastically changes the game. Not only is it cheaper and faster, but it costs less, too. And you don't have to leave your couch. And you don't have to leave your couch, and, and, uh, like, you know, and it's more in, private, good, cheap, and fast. Like it could be a real game changer in this and, remittance market. And uh, a lot of, uh, if you have a lot of listeners in the U.S., you know, customer service, at, at, even at banks, although people complain about it, is relatively good. You know, there's not long lines. You know, someone will, if you have a complaint, listen to you. Um, in Panama, it was just payday last Saturday, and I walked to the mall, and there's like a banking area. And I actually took some pictures. Every single bank had a line out the door, probably about 30 minutes. Holy cow. And, and Western Union had the, the same thing. Um, so, you know, so everybody's there's real, sending money on payday. There's real lost productivity by all these people having to use these legacy systems where they're literally getting up to the front of the line, writing you know, the name of the person in pen uh, of you know, the information that they want to send. Someone else is then taking all that information, writing it in the computer. You know, then they're using the banking system in Swift. And then the same thing's happening on the reverse side, so you can see why they There's have to charge those fees. There's just all this manual labor, all this like time-consuming bureaucracy yeah. that is just, it's like the DMV. It's just horrible. Yeah, yeah. And, then, <laughs> and they don't really, you know, they don't care that much if the money gets there. You know, you're not a very profitable customer if you're sending $200. So, right, you know, they, they're not going to... Maybe they gonna... made $10, um, You know, if something goes wrong, you're, you know, getting the line to back again and... and you know, we'll look into it. Yeah, the cost to the cost for customer service is not even worth what the the person pays in their fees. And yeah, I mean, it's just the whole remittance area. I think it's just ripe for disruption like this. Yeah, uh, it's the, very exciting. Yeah, it's ripe for disruption. But you know, Bitcoin by itself, I don't think solves it because you need people on both ends that can. Um, you know, you need organization on both ends to you know get get into the right currency in and out. Um, and potentially pr provide the right, um, you know, legal aspects of um, complying with AML and KYC. Um, so I think in the Bitcoin space, whereas Western Union has basically, you know, developed the scale to be able to do this in 180 countries, um, in the Bitcoin space, it's going to be a lot of partnerships. So Coinpult working with people in, in a bunch of countries, or you know. Um, well, have you seen uh, the HelloBit app? Yeah, because uh, I mean that's really fun. It's kind of like an Uber, but for human ATMs and like. Yeah, I there's you know 50 companies potentially that uh, have some insight into how to 
do this, and they're building the technology today. It might have some of them are released, and some are, are coming down the pike. Um, you know, I think in the next year you're going to see uh, just tons of competition in that space of people that understand their local market and understand Bitcoin and can act as like a node in this decentralized system exactly. um, and, and compete for the, the business on you know beating Western Union on price and customer service because their underlying costs are so much less. So most people, you know, haven't even traveled outside the U.S., assuming people listening to this podcast are mainly U.S., <laughs> but I think that shapes a lot of our view of the world. Like, you've now lived in Panama how long? I've been there for about 18 months. 18 months living full-time down in Panama, yeah. traveling out for conferences or whatnot. Mm -hmm. Like, what, what have you learned? Like, what have you learned from this experience of traveling abroad, dealing with money, trying to get money moved around, like trying to buy groceries, all these things? So, Quintipult's slogan is destroying payment obstacles. Back, Making back it to the, easy. Back to the catapult, and that was kind of, you know, the, the you know the, where the tagline came from. And uh, I think the one... You know, looking through it, uh, the the perspective of a Bitcoiner and living in Panama, there are so many payment obstacles in the world that um, need to be destroyed that aren't adding any value. Um, that the, the the field is green for anyone that can um, figure out how to do it. Um, you know, many of our employees that are uh, Panamanian they don't have bank accounts. Um, when we first, you know, we're getting set up and didn't know exactly how everything worked. We got one of our employees set up with a bank account, sent a wire from the U.S. They were charged $185 for the receiving fee for a $400 wire. Unbelievable. They were charged like 50% almost on a $400 wire? Yeah. Uh, and how much did it cost to send it? it was, 35 bucks, Yeah, 35 probably? 45 bucks, depending on which so bank. So that's over 50% in fees. Yeah, banks aren't good for transactions under, you know, call it $2,000. They're not good for transactions over I don't, over want, to, I don't want to pay $2,000 <laughs> fee on a, uh, $200 fee on a $2,000 transaction. That's yeah. absurd, too. And that's, you know, living in the U.S., uh, even though wire fees we think are kind of steep, you know, $45 just to send my money, you know, to France and in the time that it would take to ship an yeah. anvil, that doesn't seem right. But in, um, you know, the, the developing world, it's much, <laughs> much worse. Um, first, you probably don't even have a bank account, you know, 70% of, I'm pulling that stat out of nowhere, but it's, it's roughly, you know, 70% of the world does not have access to a bank account or traditional financial services. Um, and when you see, you know, when you actually meet people and talk to them about their lives not having access to this, it's like, um, you know, it's, it's, they're totally disconnected from shopping on the internet, from earning money on the internet, you know, if they've got skills, you know, learning web design skills. Um, yeah, I think I think the Philippines is now 20% of GDP is from uh, outsourced freelance work. And I've got a friend that runs a charity called Educate, and they basically train entrepreneurs in Uganda. They're integrated with the public schools and everything, and I think that the entrepreneurs, they earn twice as much per month if they go through the Educate course. And so it's really helping lift that standard of living. And from what I understand, it costs as much in monthly account maintenance fees for the bank as their cell phone does. Why have a bank account? I mean, that's just the monthly maintenance fees. You get dinged with a ton of bajillion other fees over there, too. When you can just replace all of that with something like Coinapult, SMS over your phone, and you're, you're able to send and store your money on there. Yeah, I can say from the perspective of running a Bitcoin company and paying people globally, I don't know how I would I would go insane if I didn't have Bitcoin as the option. You know, I have um, we have employees around the world, and if uh, on payday, it's one click and they're paid, um, and and there's no fees. Um, you know, yeah, you, isn't it just crazy? Like, did you see the transaction like a, a couple weeks ago? Eighty four million dollars in yeah, one transaction, four four cent fee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, what other system can do that? Like they can send pennies or send tens of millions of dollars all for a little or no fees. Like what other system can do that? Yeah. And, um, you know, when, when you get, you, you use Bitcoin as the underlying um, architecture, the if plumbing. you can have, yeah. um, you know, companies like ours, like internal sends, there's, there's no fee. So, you know, for both clinical users, yes, there's the issue of centralization that traditional Bitcoiners Yeah, but uh, you can hate. always withdraw your Bitcoins out. Like, yeah. 
I think it's fine to have different centralized entities within the ecosystem. Yeah. You just need to be able to take your Bitcoins out whenever you want, or according yeah. to the terms of service that you knowingly and willfully and with plenty of understanding have agreed to. Yeah. Because uh, I think I think our current banking system, we, we they rely too much on this implied consent. They think that people have consented to not actually owning their bank account. I mean, you're an unsecured creditor at the end of the day. Yeah, the, the term is... Most people don't understand the money in their bank account is not their money. It's the bank's money, and you're an unsecured creditor of the bank. Yeah, you're, you're giving them a loan, and uh, they're taking that and doing what they want with it. It's, yeah. it's not your $2,000 that you deposited. It's theirs now. Yeah, and the irony is that it's actually got a negative interest rate. You know, you're paying your account monthly account fee. You're paying negative interest rates in Germany. Yep. Uh, all of this craziness. Like, there's really no particular reason to have bank accounts anymore. Yeah, not to say anything against the inflation-adjusted rate. There are really negative interest rates. Yeah, they're. I mean, they're slower. They're more expensive. The customer service is bad. There's huge bureaucracy. Like, all of this, services like Coinapult makes... Payments easy, yeah, right. Like, yeah, but banks are on every street, and people are used to you know those. Well, we've uh, had banks. Barriers. We've had um, banks for five hundred years, right? Like, yeah. Uh, but things are changing. Technology is changing. Yeah, I've talked to some bankers that are recognizing that uh, okay, things are changing. Uh, they're not ready to make any changes to their business model, but you know, some of the smart ones are like, so tell me how this works, and how could we integrate it? You know, they're, they're starting to ask the questions. There's you know a few banks that have you know made some some real moves but i think uh it'll be interesting to see over the next five years uh which big name banks cease to exist because they're because they know, haven't adapted they're holding to that old world yeah. model they're uh you know selling buggy whips and the automobile is here well i think we're about out of time for this particular interview is there anything that you're most concerned about or most optimistic about in bitcoin land um i'm most optimistic about it seems like every month I see more and more usability of Bitcoin. Um, so I actually had an aha moment like two weeks ago. Um, I was just you know doing my work and, and you know looking some things up, and four different times through the, throughout the day I had to either pay or was asked, asked to donate, and each time there was Bitcoin accepted. Um, you know I, I got through a. Uh, um, a, a service that provides um, private, private browsing. I forget, I forget which uh, which service it is, and they ask for a recommended donation. And so I was like, "All right, I'm gonna have to whip out my credit card, and I'm I'm not gonna, you know, my recommended donation is gonna be zero because." Um, but there was Bitcoin accepted, and so you know, I sent them the recommended ten dollars, and uh, you know, each time I whip out my phone, I scan the QR, and the transaction is done in two seconds. Um, couldn't be easier. So seeing that, um, you know, obviously I consider myself a Bitcoin evangelist, but even if I wasn't, that this is really easier um, the, when you have Bitcoin. The utility is coming. Like, yeah. People like yourselves are building out the solutions that the market's demanding. Yeah, every day And it's getting this critical mass. Yeah, there's just more and more, and, and uh, you know, the, the difficult question of two years ago when my friends that weren't in Bitcoin, well, what do I do with it? You know, well, potentially you can do X, Y, and Z. And now we see, you know, now I'm really seeing you can do X, Y, and Z, and it's it's starting to happen. Um, so, I, and I, you know, just from talking to people at, the, at this conference and the, the others that are building throughout the world, uh, most of it hasn't really been released. You know, the, the coolest ideas are still in incubation. Um, you know, they're in people's brains, trying to get coded and built to production. So. Yeah. I'm well, very optimistic about that. Well, thanks so much for taking the time for this interview, for building things out. Uh, Justin Blinko, Chief Operating Officer at Coinapol. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for the time, Trace. Be sure to get a copy of the free Bitcoin Guide at freebitcoinguide.com. Got a question or suggestion? Record your voice at bitcoin.kn. Don't be shy. To help the show, share Bitcoin.kn with friends, post about it on Reddit, and otherwise, spam the interwebs. Your iTunes comments and five-star reviews are very important to us. Please continue tuning in to the Bitcoin Knowledge Podcast, where we release interviews with the top people in the Bitcoin world. 
Now take some choline and let that Bitcoin knowledge consolidate. 